Hello and welcome to chapter 3. Now, chapter 3 is going to bring us some more describing of data. This time we're going to look into the numerical measures and actually going to have some formulas here. So again, I'm your host, Professor Naragon, and we're going to break down chapter 3. All right. I know that was so exciting. <laughs> of course, we have the learning objectives right here. So we're going to actually dive into some of these terms you may have actually known. But um, we're going to dive into the mean, the median, and the mode. We're going to look at how we compute a weighted mean. And then we're going to compute and interpret the range, variance, which is a fun one, and standard deviation. And then we're going to explain and apply Chepsis. Chepsis. Sorry, I butcher names all the time. But anyway, we're going to look at Chepsis. Chepsis. I will give one day. But his theorem and the empirical rule, which is actually a pretty fun rule, pretty simple. But this is going to bring in a lot more formulas in this chapter, which we will experience as we progress in this course. Starting off first, measure of location. These are the three big ones that we typically use, the three M's. So mean, median, and mode. Yes. So we're going to dive into each of these. Again, these measures of location is a value used to describe the central tendency of a set of data. The arithmetic mean is the most widely reported measure of location. Um, again, that's mostly uh, coming to uh, averages and how many numbers repeat themselves. So, and just basically the middle. Yeah, we're going to get into all those. Starting off first, start diving into the mean, okay? So, population mean. Now, in this course, uh, or not in this course, in this chapter, you're going to hit a lot more um, fun symbols that we like to use in statistics. So, I would either save this uh, slide so you can see what they are, and kind of go back to it. So, we have mu, which is a fun little M with a long line. You got one long leg, one short leg. Uh, represents the population mean. Okay. And then we have the big N, capitalized N, is the number of values in the population. So, again, we're looking at values in the pop. X is going to represent any particular value, just like algebra. X is always whatever number we're going to end up using. And then we got sigma. Okay, and this is an indication of the operation of adding. We've seen sigma in Excel when we do sum all. So they're back again. So we have sigma X is the sum of the X values in the population. So, with this formula to calculate population mean, for raw data, the population mean is calculated by adding the values of the operation divided by the total number of observations. That's what it basically is. These are population values because we are including all the values under consideration. Remember, before, we were using a little bit more sample sizes, which only grabbed a few. Here, since we're using population, or using all values. Okay. So, an example of a population mean is the mean closing price for Johnson Johnson stock. Why not use Johnson Johnson? For the last five days is $139.05. Basically, they're taking an average of their closing prices. So, it's an example of the perimeter. 
diameter. Yes. Nice. So, example, an example here. There are 42 exits on I-75 through the state of Kentucky. Listed below are the distance between exits in miles. So we got all these numbers here. And we got two questions. Why is this information a population? And what is the mean number of miles between exits? Now, we're going to basically answer these two questions as they go. I'm going to show you how they work. And then later in our practice problems, we're actually going to do together those practice problems. But here I just want to show you how it functions. So, here you go. Why is this information of population? This is a population because we are considering all of the exits in Kentucky. Okay. So, there's 42 exits in the state of Kentucky. We have all 42. It's a lot of numbers. So what is the mean number? What is the average miles between each exit? Well, again, since we're looking at the population mean, basically mu right there. Man, that keeps making me think of a Pokemon. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, as you can see on top it, of the fraction, the numerator, is the sum of all these numbers. So yes, we can type them all into Excel because we don't have an Excel sheet. And basically do the sum of them and divide it by the total of them. So 42 exits. That's how many items we have. And that will give us our average, our mean... Your main one, Mr. Grinch, of 4.57, okay? So, that's a population mean. We can still make means other ways. The other way is doing the other item that we typically use in stats, the sample. Yes, the sample. Notice... The formula is almost the same, except for one thing. We don't have mu. Mu is gone. It's gone because, again, mu was representing a population. Since we're only picking and choosing to get like an overall feel of everything, we have a new letter. And this is X with a bar on top. X bar. Which sounds like a WWE wrestler. But. <laughs> I just like it. X with almost a hat on it. But this is going to represent. Sample mean. And we're going to typically see this more often. Again. As we deal with big populations. That have a vast number. Because we're not going to go. It's going to be harder to do. A population mean. If we took the entire population of Texas. Um, that's incredibly tough. So, we're going to take a sample. But if we want to just do something simple, again, we could do the population. But if it's a little bit tougher, we do sample. So here's our example. We're going to take Verizon is studying the number of hours per day that people use their mobile phones. A random sample of 12 customers, because we already know uh, Verizon has a lot of customers, so they only pick 12 random, show the following daily usage in hours. So what does the arithmetic mean number of hours used last month? So again, we're looking for the average. 
I like to use average more than mean. Mean is the technical term for uh, stats, but it's a pretty much interchanged. So, what is the mean, basically? So we're going to take the sum, again, of all the values that we're going to use. So 4.1 th plus 3.7 plus 4.3, so forth and so on, until we have all 12 values added together. And then we're going to divide by the number of values, which is 12. Yay! So we come out to 54, even, which they really tried hard for that one. Uh, divide by 12 and be 4.5. So when we analyze that, this will tell us the arithmetic mean number of hours per day that people use their mobile phones is about 4.5 hours. Okay. Again, does that already say that's directly in the middle? No. It's an average. So we're going to get into what we define with mode and medium. Media. All right. So when we still look at the arithmetic mean, remember we still got our descriptive terms. So it can still be an interval or ratio. Scale of measurement is required. Again, I have that almost that continuous uh, data flow. But it's got to be where the zero can be significant if it's ratio. If it's not, again, it's got to be meaningful. All the data values are used in the calculation. Okay. The mean is unique. I like how they put it as it's unique. Now, the sum of the deviations from the mean equals zero. Okay. Now, a weakness of the mean is that it is affected by extreme values. So what are we talking about here? So, if one or two of the values in the data set are extremely large, basically unpredictable, uh, an outlier, that's what we usually call them if we graph them, are small compared to the majority of data, the mean may not be representative of the data set. Okay, That outlier is probably throwing out more of our data than what we need to and shifting our mean. So it may not actually represent of the data set and therefore may not be the best average to use. And you may choose to use another measure of location like median or mode to represent the data. So right now, mean is just an average, but can be so swayed by an outlier. We're going to get into uh, other ones that help kind of hone in and bring back this average. So the median. Median is the midpoint of the values after they have been ordered from the minimum to maximum values, okay? Basically, which one lands directly in the middle? <laughs> I like to use that a lot of times. So, is a value that's in the middle of the set of order data. So, we do put it in correct order. Often used to describe data sets where they are one or just a few extreme values, such as with real estate prices, which is our example right here, or household incomes in a particular area. Okay. So the numbers that represent right here are actually the condos of Palm Air, with an arithmetic mean price of 110000 It's like, why is it 110000 Well, again, if we add them up and divide by, looks like, 5, that's where we get. The reason why, also, that it's so high and doesn't really look like it flows with the data 
It is because of that huge outlier of 275000 Okay, That's one good condo that sold for that. So when finding the median, it doesn't matter if the values are sorted in ascending order or descending order, as long as it's minimum to max. Okay. Since there are an odd number of values in this data set, it is fairly easy to find the value that divides the set in half. Now, if we have an even, we're going to have to basically divide the two. But odd, very easy. Find the middle. The number that's going to be in the middle if we're going to talk about median. All right. This really does help hone in the data because really, they're not going to all sell for 110000 That's a little bit too high. We're finding out that mostly they're going to stay between the sixty to 80000 range. But right now for our data set, 70000 is the median. Okay. So, again, we've already talked... That's the middle of the set of order data. At least the ordinal scale of measurement is required. Again, ranking system. It is not influenced by extreme measures, which helps it out a little bit. 50% of observations are larger than the median. That's true, and 50% is going to be lower than the, the median. Anyway, <laughs> it is unique to a set of of data okay so this is really going to be helpful for us again when the mean doesn't fairly represent our set of data so we may end up using the median so to find the median for an event number data set sort the observation and calculate the average of the two middle values this is when it's basically an even number. So, and they do this fun little. <laughs> Let's just go right through. <laughs> All right. So, here's the number of hours of a sample of 10 adults used Facebook last month. Notice that we're dealing with an even uh, number set. So, again, we're going to arrange it from either minimum to the max or the max to the minimum. Uh, Minimum. And again, we're going to pop up the same two numbers in the middle. We have five and seven. So what we're going to do is basically we can add the two and divide by two, which five plus seven uh, will equal to 12. And then divide by two will give us six. Or we can basically see right now we're two numbers away, and average is going to be six no matter what. So, the medium, median for this data set is going to be six. So, odd, odd's a little bit easier. Odd is going to be right there. When it's even, we got to take an average. All right. Now we hit mode. All right. Mode is a little bit different. Mode is going to be the value of observations that occur most frequently. So we're going to see who shows up the most. Basically, who repeats themselves. The mode can be found for nominal level data. So we're looking at the basic, easiest uh, level of data that we had. A set of data can have more than one mode. Good. We could have an even amount. Uh, same with the same set. Like two of the highest. A set of data can, could have no mode. That's true. Nobody repeats itself. So technically there is no mode. Or we can say all of them is mode. Which makes no sense. It's usually no mode if there's no. No all the mode. Right there. So... When we look at mode, it is a useful tool for us in summarizing nominal level of data. Uh, 
for our example that we actually have here, they have a company that has developed five bath oils and has conducted a marketing survey to find which bath oil consumers prefer. As we can see, Lamore uh, is the highest. So this is going to be our mode, basically. Mode can be determined for all levels of measurement and is not affected by extreme values. So, again, just like the median, mode is not affected by extreme values. Um, the only one that is, is the mean. Now, a disadvantage of using this mode is that a data set may not have a mode or that they have more than one mode. So, yeah, that is a big disadvantage for looking for modes. So here's a graphic of three different ways that we can have these guys. One is the classic bell curve, where there's one high point right dead on in the middle. If it's right dead on in the middle, that means mean, median, and mode are going to all be the same. We love those. Makes life easy. But this is an imperfect world, and we're not going to have the perfect data all the time. So, we can have a positive skewed distribution, where we have most of our numbers are basically early on, a little positive, and we have a lot of later on, greater than, extremes. This will mean mode and medium are probably going to favor more closer to uh, zero in the way that it is. And mean is going to be a little bit higher up. Okay, That's the way that we got positive. Mean is usually greater than our median and mode. A negative screwed, uh, screw, skewed, skewed distribution. You see the opposite. Where, again... Mean is going to be less. There's more uh, extremes on the negative side of our median and mode. Okay. So it really depends where does that mean fall that helps us determine if it's positive or negative. Okay. But y'all having so much fun learning about these guys. All right. Next, it's time to hit Weighted mean. Okay. So, learning objective basically two now. We finally made it to that. After learning the big three. So, again, we're dealing with mean. Again, average. Uh, the weighted mean is found by multiplying each observation. So, each one, our number is X, by its corresponding weight. Okay. So, for example easier to do example on these we have carter's construction company the triple c is paying its hourly employees 16 dollars and 50 cents 19 dollars or 25 dollars per hour okay there are 26 hourly employees so we already got how many values we have is 26 we have 14 that get paid that 1650 weight 10 at 19 and 2 at 25 uh, dollar rate. What is the mean hourly rate paid for these 26 employees? So when we look at the weight, the weight is how many times this number actually is going to repeat itself. That's really what's going on right now. So we know 14 are being paid 1650. So we're going to multiply. 14 times $16.50. We know 10 are being paid at 19. So 10 times 19. And then 2 at the 25. So we're going to add those together. Then we're going to divide by our value. Now for them, they did the weights. They added the weights together. So 14 plus 10 plus 2 would still equal out to 26. It's a good way to double check to make sure you have all the values if they specifically number the value, okay? 
Sometimes they don't give us in the problem that there's 26, so we would have to add the weights together. So in total, if we did the multiplication, be $471 divided by 26, or roughly about $18, and they got 0.1154, and they went specific on the mean, most likely in the actual problem, you will round to the nearest cent, so like $18.12. So now, that's the wait. That's learning objective two right there. As long as you know that, you're good. So now we're jumping into or actually learning objective number three with the study disper uh, dispersion. Ah, dispersion. Sometimes you can't talk when you dig these videos. But anyway, the dispersion in the variation of sp spread or spread in a set of data. Well, we're going to look at range, variance, and standard deviation. Okay. So, a measure of location only describes the center of the data. That's what we've been doing. Does not tell us anything about the spread of the data. Those extremes. Okay. So, we need... We may need to know something about these. These may actually help us determine um, what to do. So, it allows us to compare two or more distributions. Small measures of distribution, of dispersion, uh, indicate the data are closely clustered around the mean, and therefore the mean is representative of the data. Large measures of dispersion indicate that the mean may not re represent the data. So we have too much extreme measures. So again, we're basically figuring out, does the mean work for us? Okay. So how do we get these? Well, let's start off first. Let's start off with the more easiest one. And that is the range. Okay. Now, the range is the difference between the maximum and minimum values in a set of data. Okay. Maximum value minus minimum value. Nothing big there. The major characteristics of this range are only two values are used in the calculation. And it's, it is influenced by extreme values. So if it's a large difference, this again will tell us the mean doesn't represent the data very well. If it's a small range, then there's more likely of a chance that the mean is representing the value or the data right there. It is easy to compute and to understand. Big advantage. Because, again, if I tell you what the range is, oh, you just take maximum minus minimum. But we're not going to stop there. Why shall we stop there? We're going to add... Variance, a fun equation right there with, mm, with sigma square. Now, population variance. This is going to be, of course, using our Greek alphabet, which everybody loves. We're going to start off with sigma squared. And we're going to take the sum, sigma, again, of x, which is the value of the particular observation, minus mu, mu, again, the rhythmic mean of the population, and we're going to square it. So it's the sum of x minus mu squared. Okay, it's going to be fun. We're going to show you what it looks like. Don't worry. And again, in the lar the capitalized in is the number of observations in the population. All right? Biggest things that help us out here. All observations are used in calculation. Helps us get more pinpoint. 
The units are somewhat difficult to work with. They are the original units squared. Yeah. So it is a little bit more complicated. This is why we do have Excel and calculators. It helps us out tremendously. So here we go. Here's our example. The number of traffic citations issued last year by month in Bayford County, South Carolina, is reported below. So there's our 12 months. There's our number of citations. So that's X. That's our value. Okay. Now we want to determine the population variance. Again, we're using all citations that were actually issued and not a sample of them. So, total citations that we have is 348. Okay. So, with that being said, we want to find mu, which mu in itself is going to be all the citations, 348, divided by 12. Again, 12 because, again, that is how many months of the year. That is our population variance. We only have 12 numbers. So we find out that mu is 29. Next, we're going to break it down. I'd rather you all break it down like this. Uh, either put it in Excel with the formulas to make it a little bit easier on yourselves in calculating. Okay. So we're going to take 29 and minus it from X. So X minus 29. So 19 minus 29 gives us negative 10 and so forth and so on. I go and say all the numbers. And in the end, Looks like it comes down to zero. Typically will. Okay. Again, it's minus the average. So it's going to go basically down to zero. Next, in another column, we're going to square those numbers. So negative 10 squared. Basically negative 10 times negative 10 comes out to a positive 100. They're going to typically always be positive. They will never be negative. Okay. And then we add them all together, and that brings us our 1,488 and divide by 12, which ends up equaling to 124. So the population variance for the number of citations is 124. Again, we're going to try to keep an idea. If it seems too big, if it's too large compared to our numbers, we may see that the mean, uh, again, is not significant enough. But again, we're just trying to get y'all used to calculating it. Now, Standard deviation. Variance is our sigma squared. Standard deviation goes, we ain't squaring it anymore. We're going to take that exact number that you made right here, and we're going to take the square root of it, which sometimes can happen. <laughs> Good. Sometimes it does not. <laughs> I won't say that. So, it's the same units as original data. So, no matter what, you do calculate out variance on nearly every time you figure out standard deviation. It's going to be the square root of the average square distance from the mean. It cannot be negative. And it's mostly widely used as a measure of dispersion. Typically, we do. We use standard deviation a lot lot more than any other when we're looking at distribution. So again, 
that's one of our big ones. We want you to know the formulas. So have all these formulas written down. I will tell you that. Makes life a lot easier. Right, again, sample. Sample variance and sample standard deviation. They are shown by the symbol of S, S squared for variance, and just regular S for uh, standard. And again, Rx with the hat is back, X bar, which is the mean of the sample. And then we have little n minus 1. Okay. So it makes it a little bit more fun with that minus 1. That is another big difference. And we're going to basically show you what's going on here. A little bit later on. But again, that's the number of observations in the sample minus 1. Sample size end up doing that quite often. Uh, it's okay. I really like how the book just didn't. They do examples for everything in the notes, not that. I'm going to change that. Okay. Here's our guy that I cannot pronounce his name to save my life. Chibet Shiv. Chibet Shiv. Uh, theorem. Basically states this. For any set of observations, sample or population, okay, the proportion of the values that lie within K standard deviations okay, of the mean is at least 1 minus 1 over K squared. So 1 divided by K squared, where K is the, any value greater than 1. So when we look at this, by the way, this, this is, I mean, if you didn't tell by the name, he is Russian, a Russian mathematician, very smart guy. Um, he basically developed this theorem that allows us to determine the minimum proportion of values that lie within a specified number of standard deviations of the mean. Okay. So when we look at this, we're going to actually figure out a little bit of a percentage. How does this standard devi deviation basically shape out? Okay. So our example here is Dupree Paint Company employees contribute a mean of $51.54 to the company's profit sharing plan every two weeks. Okay. The standard deviation of the bi-weekly contributions is 7.51. At least what percent, percent of the contributions lie within plus 3.5 standard deviations and minus 3.5 standard deviations? Of the mean, this is between... $25.26 and $77.83. Alright, so our key number here using this theorem is the standard deviations. Okay. Again, it's always greater than 1. And we already know standard deviations are always positive, so it will never, ever be uh, negative. But, notice again, it sticks with the same number. It has to be squared. So we're always going to look at plus 3.5 standard deviations and minus 3.5 standard deviations. And it founds out that about 92% are basically in between this range. By taking 1 minus 1 divided by k squared, our theorem formula, and inserting our standard deviations, 3.5 squared. Okay, So 1 minus 1 divided by 3.5 squared, which is basically 1 divided by 12.25, comes out to 92. Okay, So again, this just says about 92% of the values are alive within the mean. So it can be used regardless of the shape of the distribution. 
That's fine. That's dandy. Again, fun formula. Be wary if we actually have to calculate standard deviation and then get into uh, Trebetsi's uh, theorem. Where again, since we're not a full-fledged statistics course, I mean, actually arithmetic statistics, and we stick to closer to business, some of this is a little bit, again, closer to a business professional's knowledge. So, we try not to go too in-depth right now, especially at the beginning. Especially for your first uh, unit. Okay? Now, the empirical rule for a symmetrical bell-shaped frequency. So, it does have to be symmetrical. Distribution of approximately 68% of the observation. About 68% will lie within plus and minus one standard deviation of the mean. About 95% of the observation will lie within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean. And practically all 97, not 90, all 99.7% will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Those numbers are very key. Okay, so we usually see like x bar minus or plus 2 standard deviations. Again, that would mean 95. 1 will have 68, but if it's like between x and like x bar plus or minus 2, uh, that's like almost half of the 95%. So we'll get into all that. Nice little fun little facts that are about to happen. Ethics. Ethics. Again, we're dealing with ethics. And reporting results. Now, I will always state it every time we mention exits. Kind of like my little warning. That I can't teach you ethics. I just basically go... I mean, these are the decisions. You already know right and wrong. And it's up to you to do it however you like. So starting off first, ethics and reporting results. Useful to know the advantages and disadvantages of mean, median, mode. As we report statistics and as we use statistics to make decisions. This basically means this. Know when to use these. As you can see, mean has a big disadvantage. Uh, and so does mode, because there can be no mode, and there can be multiple modes. Um, know what your data is asking for, and if it's going to be useful. Especially mean. If I'm looking for an average, and I got two huge, too many big uh, outliers, basically those extremes, uh, it's not going to be good for making a decision on. Important to maintain an independent and principled point of view. You have to be independent from the data. You cannot have bias to it. If you have bias, you typically go on to do wrong things sometimes. Again, that's how much uh, basically pride you got, how much uh, ethnic, I mean, ethical, ah, ethics <laughs> you got. You know what's right and what's wrong. You don't want to mislead. I was trying to find the word and I just couldn't find it. And then the statistical reporting requires objective and honest communication of any results. Honesty is the best policy, especially when it comes to statistics. Because again, numbers don't lie. They're going to always, I mean, they're going to basically, the data is there. And if you try to be dishonest, and it seems weird, somebody's going to go back through that data and determine something else. Okay? And I could find out. Again, we don't want the end results. We don't want you to see y'all going to jail. Because if you go to jail, I will find you. I'll teach you something because I'm a professor. And then I'm going to probably throw a chunk of it at you because you did something wrong. I don't want to do that to any of my students. 
So don't go to jail. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, that's a fun way to conclude Chapter 3. So let's go ahead and jump into the last part, what they always give us, and that is practice problems. Yes, our practice problems are here because we got friends on the other side. Now, we're not doing any voodoo. We're going to go ahead and try and figure out the information at hand. So starting off first, we have the accounting firm of Wawatiti. Wawatiti? Dang these names. <laughs> and Koppel, Koppel uh, specialize in income tax returns for self-employed professionals, such as physicians, dentists, architects, and lawyers. The firm employs 11 accounts who prepare the returns for the last year. The number of returns prepared by each account was 58, 75, 31, 58, 46, 65, 60, 71, 45, 58, 80. That sound like uh, a little like uh, taking bids right there for a second there. So what they want us to do is find the mean, median, and mode of the number of returns Paired by each account. If you could report only one, which measure of location would you recommend? Okay. So, again, we can actually use our Excel if we wanted to use our Excel. Hello, Excel. And let's go ahead and put in the numbers 58, 75, 31, 58. Six, six, five, sixteen. All right, so there's our numbers. Now, of course, your homework does uh, give you all those Excel spreadsheets to help out. But real quick, we know we have 11, but we're going to go ahead and take data and sort it. Why? Because we have an odd number. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So right there, there is our median. Again, there's our median. All right. And guess what? Here's our mode. It's 58 also because that is the one that repeats the most. Let's see, anybody else repeat? So we know 58 is our mode. Okay, put them in different colors. So we know the mode is 58 for the sample. Okay, next, what is the average? Again, if you can see the bottom right here, the actual will tell you the average or the median down at the bottom, which is 58.818. Okay. Again, we can also go to formulas. And if you want to find statistical ones, you can. We're probably going to have a lot of these. But this is... Uh, all the stats formulas that Connect actually has. So where I can find the median to uh, finding the average. Okay. Notice again, they don't have mean. They have modes. Modes. So it would find the mode for you. But again, this would be like the most complicated one. And you would put in all the numbers in if you need to. But I can just do it like that. Average A1 to A11. And it will calculate for me. 
Again, if we want to use the calculator and do it manually, we add them all up, which again, the sum. So if I go click on all these and go formulas, auto sum, there's our sum. Again, we take the sum, or basically this square, so equal this divided by the number 11. Comes out the same. There's multiple ways of actually figuring out the numbers when you got Excel working for you. Again, working smarter as we're Excel is our biggest stats user ever. So, back to our PowerPoint. We found out that both the median and the mode fall at 58. Again, using the Excel to help us. And we found out the average is about 58.82. Again, if we want to round it to two decimal places, which basically means they're all basically almost the same number. So if we go and recommend a measure of location, all three will work, especially since median and mode are basically the same. And then our uh, mean, our average, is almost dead on to it too. So it doesn't matter which one, they're all basically at the same location. So this is like one of those almost symmetrical bell curves. All right, question 25. The Lores healthcare system employs 200 persons on the nursing staff. 50 are nurses' aides, uh, 50 are practical nurses, and 100 are registered nurses. Nurses' aides receive $12 an hour, practical nurses $20 an hour, and registered nurses $29 an hour. Okay, what is the rated mean hourly wage? All right. I like how they threw in a weighted one. So, biggest thing, bring in our calculator. Get them along, clear out everything. And remember, weighted average in itself. Oh, we met the calculator. One and go away. So, calculator in itself. We take, we'll put in parentheses. Double parentheses for each one. So we have 50 nurses multiply by the amount that they get, or 50 are nurses' aides. So nurses' aides get 12 plus. Again, we have 50 are practical nurses multiply it by there, which is 20. Plus, and now we got registered nurses, which are 100, times their wage of 29. Okay, so again, calculators are great. They do all the math for us. We just got to know the formula. So we're going to divide it by our hourly, I mean, basically our total. So total rates, it's going to be 200, but I want to do it just like the formula. Okay, and then have it calculate. So our total wage, mean hours wage, is $22.50. Not too bad. Okay. All right. Question. I like how it just says question 25 and then just question. Yes, please. All right. So this question looks like it actually should not be here because this is talking about geometric mean. We did not discuss geometric mean. Okay. 
That's an interesting way, but let's go ahead and go through it. So, in 2011, there were 232.2 million cell phone subscribers in the United States. By 2017, the number of subscribers increased to 265.9 million. What is the geometric mean annual percentage increase for the period? Right. So, when we look at geometric mean, it's basically taking uh, n minus 1. Um, I'm basically heard using the sixth root of 265.9. Divide by 232.2 minus 1. Sixth root. So. Let's see. Calculator. We have. 265.9. And that is going to go the sixth root oh, that's to the sixth power that is interesting yeah it's going to the sixth root so we would have to uh, I don't even think we have it on this calculator to do that and we only got square root so you would actually have to have a whole different calculator than the one that we have prescribed. And it's supposed to be 2.28%. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't done geometric. That's why it's question blank. So this slide, let's throw this out. We're not going to deal too much with geometric mean. And if we do find it uh, in any quiz or homework, as it seems like it's snuck in, which we're not going to deal with, uh, let me know. I'll make sure to adjust points. I'll take a screenshot of the question so I can know to uh, later remove that because it looks like they snuck in. So we're not going to deal with that because that one seems like that one's actually supposed to be for the stats book. Uh, other stats book. Not business stats for us. Yeah, that's a fun one right there. The fun things you find in these... Little slides in themselves. Okay. All right. I mean, we're probably going to get into geometric mean later on, but not in this chapter. Yeah. I think that's just something that wasn't supposed to actually be there. Anyway. Alright. So now range mean variance. Dave's automatic door installs automatic garage doors. Openers. The following list indicates the number of minutes. Need to install 10 doors openers. Again. 28, 32, 24, so forth and so on. And really we want to find the range the mean, and the variance. Now again, we can take Excel. And this is again what I would rather y'all do. It's how we do this for variance. Let's take our calculator. Let's bring back our item. Again, we're going to do a new page, put the numbers in. New page. 28, 32, 24, 46, 44, 40, 54, 32, 42. All right. Since we're not really looking at, uh, let me actually do another uh, little tab. So original data right there. Remember, variance is uh, x minus mu, which can't put mu in here, so I'm just going to definitely put like a little case m, and then x minus 
mu squared. All right. Again, we're not going to go to depth. I'm not going to say make it complicated for yourself. But we need to find the mean range for us. If you want to do range very quickly, again, we can sort it. So data sort. Okay. Again, we're going to shift them down. All right. So here, range equals our largest data, maximum minus minimum. Okay, so the range is 30. That's it. That's range. Yay! Now, we need to find the average. Again, we can sum, and we know it's divide by 10. So let's do a quick auto sum. Auto sum. Boom. So we have 380. So our mean is 380 divided by 10. Because we have 10 numbers. So our mean is 38. Okay, cool. Now remember this. Now we got to take these numbers. Again, minus 38. Do not just copy this cell. Reason why is that once you drag it, it miscalculates because it's going to drag down this way. Here, I can easily drag, and then boom, there's my math. Makes life easy. Okay, and then we can do an auto sum. Notice that's zero. That's what we want. Okay, that means all the math is good, and that's a good thing because it's using Excel. Makes life easy. Again, having it ranged out helps us out as well. Now we're going to basically square them. Now you can actually do power to square, but we know square is the number times itself. So it's going to equal that. Multiply that. So the same cell, multiply twice. And then again, I can do the same thing. They're going to come down, and the formula is right there. One little thing I love about Excel. <laughs> so, again, auto sum, there's 744. So our, stand, our variance is going to be the 744 divided by 10. So we're looking at about 74.4. Okay. And there we go. There's our answers to all three. Now... Again, we didn't use ge geometric mean. I don't know why they had that in there. It will come. I will tell you, it will come. But not right now. That's just amazing. Anyway. Plywood Inc. reports these returns on stockholders' equity for the past five years. 4.3, 4.9, 7.2, 6.7, and 11.6. Considering these as population values. Alright. So again, we would find all of our items. Let's bring back our Excel. Because our Excel does not go away. And we're going to do a new page. By the way, let me know if this helps y'all. I always like to know if it does. Okay? 
So 4.9, 7.2, 6.7, and 11.6. Woo! Oh, just need those. Again, data, sort. Okay. Puts it in order. We're going to insert a line to help make our graph. And then, of course, our range is our greatest number minus our smallest. So our range is 7.3. Okay. So again, I can take the average by just highlighting and looking at the bottom. But since I can't see the bottom of the screen, I want to do my famous auto sum. Formulas, auto sum, 34.7. We want to take that number and divide by five. We have five numbers. One, two, three, four, five. So it's 6.94 is the mean. Okay. So again, we know we got x minus mu and then x minus mu. In parentheses, let's forget to put in parentheses. Squared. Okay. So x minus mu, we have equal to that minus 6.94. Look at negative 2, highlight down, and then make sure we got pretty much correct. Here's our zero. Now, this is rounding by two decimal places. Again, check McGraw-Hill, check Connect, uh, whatever learning module we're using, and make sure how many decimal places it wants you to round. Okay. Variance. Again, we we'll equal this times this, so itself twice. And straight down. Notice this time, connect to side. I mean, not connect. Excel did more than one. It happens. Okay. Again, I'm going to take data, formulas, auto sum, and our variance there divided by five. Okay. So again, this is the range, this is the mean, and this is the variance. Okay, so now we need to find standard deviation, which is basically will equal the square root. And again, the formula for square root. Let's go find math. is right there sqrt again if you want to look up formulas i will always sit, tell you to look up formulas you're probably going to find formulas that i may not even know which is okay and if you do find one that works out better let me know why because it helps out everybody in the long run okay let's me make a video to show everybody else and I have no qualms of making correction videos or adding more Excel. Okay, hit OK. And our standard deviation is about 2.57 if I want to go to two decimal places. Again, use the power that we have. All right. So far, hopefully everything's been good. Again, I don't know about why this slide's here. Really should have been here. We never even discussed this in our lecture. That's just one of those fun randomness that happens. <laughs> All right. So Dave's automatic door installers again. We have the same thing, but now we have a sample. Okay. So instead of being the population size that was um, here, 
it is now the sample size. Which is fine. That's okay. All right. So again, we had this in uh, Excel. Pop up Excel. That was your calendar. And I think we had the 10 numbers right here. Yeah. So here, we figured out that the total is 744 for apparently the same numbers. Yeah. Same numbers are used 20, 28, 32, 24, 46, 44, 40, 54, 38, 32, and 42. So. All the same numbers. They're just doing the sample size. Now, sample size, we have to watch out. Okay. So, while this is the variance for population, sample is a little bit different. So, it would still use the sum, just happens to be the same number, divided by, sorry. This time, in parentheses, the total number that we use. So 10 minus 1. Okay. So, this will be 82.667. Okay. So, that's for sample size. So, if it's sample, watch out that we have to take the total value, or how many values we have, and minus 1. Again, that just signifies that it's not a population. Okay? So, again, if I want to find the standard deviation of this sample size, I would take our square root formula. So, again... Square root, where are you? There you go. Square root. Get that. And there's our standard deviation, which is 9.092121. .09 so again, depending on how far we're going round it to, we can. Biggest things. Uh, take away, again, we're just trying to get you all the math. Okay. We're going to go dive even deeper in the interpretation later on. Right now, it's just understanding how to figure out the math and how to get it to its right area. All right. So let's see if we have one more. I think we have one more. All right. Surprised that they didn't do one for, with uh, our, our Russian friends theorem. But... The distribution of weights of a sample of 1,400 cargo containers is symmetric and bell-shaped. According to Empirical's rule, what percentage of weights will lie? Okay, so again, this is knowing our rule. So if it's between, again, x bar minus 2s and x bar plus 2s, basically there's our standard deviations, sample size. Um, so it's the mean, sample mean, minus, again, 2 to the sample standard deviation. So if it's between there, the rule was stating that it's going to be about 95%. Okay. Now, between, the second one actually tries to test your knowledge, which again, x bar and x bar plus 2s. Okay. That's between the single uh, standard uh, little mean, the mean, to x plus 2. So basically it's half of what was the first question. So half of 95% will lead us to about 47.5%. Now if we just look above x bar plus uh, 2s, so we're only looking at one half and above. 
Now, to calculate that, since we know everything between is 5%, and we're dealing with the symmetrical bell curve, so everything's halved, basically, if we look above or below these x minus 2s and x plus 2s. So that's about 5% difference divided by 2, which means to make it symmetrical, uh, would give us 2.5 above x bar plus 2s. Okay. So that's it. That's all the practice prompts. Again, hopefully... <laughs> I always forget now to tell y'all to pause and then try and do it and then see how well you did. But it works either way. I'd rather uh, work with y'all and see how y'all figure out. And the same thing, we just had a strange question that pops in that we didn't even talk about geometric uh, means, which is a different whole ball game of math there. So, but besides that point, that's it. That's chapter three. So that concludes this chapter. So we're basically already done through three chapters. Yes. In this book that has 15, I know, 12 more chapters to go. That's fine. You guys are doing great. Be awesome. And I will see y'all in the next exciting chapter in statistics.